Welcome everybody to the Critical Realism Network webinar series. Uh, my name is Timothy Ratso, and I have the great uh, fortune today of being able to introduce uh, uh, Mark Carrigan and his work. Um, so Mark Carrigan is, is here uh, and he's going to talk to us about the, the problems of big data, which as we all know is the future of social science. It's here, it's going to change everything and um, there are there have been so few, I think, really uh, detailed uh, philosophical and thoughtful analysis of big data and the consequences of big data. So I'll be very interested to, to hear what um, Mark has to say today. Uh, a few things about Mark. Uh, so he did his PhD in sociology at Warwick University studying uh, under uh, Margaret Archer and wrote his dissertation on uh, personhood and morphogenesis. Uh, he's uh, been a he's done a series of work with the uh, Center for Social Ontology, uh, based at Warwick University. Which uh, I would encourage everybody to have a look at their website. They have a number of resources and, and have done a, a whole uh, uh, well a number of different things regarding questions of social ontology and morphogenesis. Um, finally, he's currently a, a postdoc uh, at the Faculty of Education at Cambridge University, uh, doing work looking at. Uh, well, these very issues of, uh, of digital social science. Um, so before I hand it over to Mark, uh, I just want to say a few things about the format. So Mark is going to, to talk to us for about, um, to about 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, during that time, you'll be able to ask questions or rather you'll be able to submit questions. Uh, and then when Mark's finished, um, presenting, I'll, I'll relay your question to him and we'll have a discussion about his presentation. So you'll see uh, on, uh, generally speaking, on the right hand side of your screen, there'll be a go to webinar control panel. There should be a simple drop down tab and you'll be able to type your questions. They will come to me and I will pass them on to Mark. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to you, Mark. Uh, yeah, thanks, Tim. And it's great to have the chance to do this, not least of all because this is what I'd intended to talk about at your conference last summer. And then the mundane reality of moving house meant I, I couldn't go in the end. And I think it's appropriate to be talking about this through a webinar because at the heart of so much of what I'll be talking about today is social mediation and new ways in which technology mediates social interaction and social relation. And uh, beforehand, we were talking about what a strange form of mediation the webinar is uh, as well. That I can't see you that I'm talking to. And in a way, that is you know, quite an interesting experience, particularly when the ideas that I'm talking about still seem too provisional to me, or more provisional than I hoped. But the process of preparing for this made me realize the extent to which many of the things that I've worked on since finishing my PhD four years ago, they all rotate around this core question, uh, this core question that I still find relatively hard to specify, hence the accumulation of terminology in my title. But in essence, uh, I'm interested in the relationship between knowledge production, how knowledge production is organized, and social change and what this means for the people who are embedded in the knowledge production process, who are objects of knowledge production process, or living through these social changes. And this is such a large, convoluted, complex topic that there are many places one could start, and the one I've chosen to start with is the concept of big data. So while this concept, and I'm distinguishing between the concept as a singular and data as a plural, is contentious and controversial. I think it can be used in a relatively straightforward sense to refer to data on a scale which challenges our existing techniques and infrastructure for collection, storage and analysis. And to the extent people use the terminology of big data in a coherent way, I think this is the heart of what they're trying to get across. But it is, as it were, a processual definition. And the fact that it points to and establishes a movement in the relationship between knowledge production and the social reality about and in relation to which this knowledge is being produced, 
creates an ambiguity and this lack of specificity provokes a kind of definitional spiral for reasons that I still don't quite understand but find oddly fascinating. This definitional spiral tends to proceed in terms of the V words, the volume of big data, the velocity of big data, the variety, the variability, the veracity, the value, the susceptibility to visualization. And obviously data lack extension, so at risk of saying something that's self-evident, the notion of big data is figurative. <clears throat> it does a certain kind of work, uh, one aspect of which is the implied contrast to small data and the way in which this contrast delineates a new age. Uh, in my writing about this, I've come to talk about it as a, an epochal cut, a way in which we discursively draw a line between the new way of doing things and the old way. And this propensity to epochal cuts, I think, suffuses the technology world. And it's an interesting question to look at what interests are served by drawing these distinction as, uh, distinctions, as well as analytically what is lost by a sad tendency to sometimes take them too seriously. And this account of the, the new age is often suffused with metaphors. The data deluge, the data avalanche, the data flood. It conveys a sense of us being overwhelmed by quantitative data. And an obvious continuity here is that historically there have been other periods where this has been a social experience. Um, and I think we need to treat these accounts, the, this kind of, we need to treat this hype critically without dismissing it for reasons that I want to come on to. But underlying it, we have the process which uh, was not the main focus, but was a core theme through the Center for Social Ontology, Social Morphogenesis Project, uh, one particularly focused on by myself, Margaret Archer and Emmanuel Lazega, which is digitalization as a process of socio-technical transformation. And in essence, by this, I mean the growing tendency for social action to be mediated by digital devices and digital infrastructures. Uh, when we buy things in person or online using credit cards or debit cards, the storage and analysis of the click streams, the sequence of moves we make as we navigate uh, digital devices, our activity on social media, um, the mobile phone, the data our mobile phones produce, what we search for are online communications. All these instances of social action being mediated by digital technology, they produce data as a byproduct of the transactions underway. And it's this transactional data, which is what people are referring to when they use the terminology of big data. Data produced in real time, unobtrusively as a side effect of an existing activity. Usually they're not always unstructured and characterized by a great deal of variety in terms of the many kinds of data which have these characteristics. And negotiating the, these literatures and these emerging fields of practice uh, is something that is a very interesting experience because it's such a polarized set of debates. And underlying it is the question of the hype surrounding big data. And what I want to argue for is that we need to ensure we don't take the notion of big data at face value, that we don't take it too seriously. But equally, I think the analysis of the hype surrounding it often creates a tendency to not take it seriously enough. The fact these epochal cuts are identified, the extent to which the rhetoric of the brave new world we're entering into can easily be characterized as you know, self-interested fluff. This can too easily give rise to a dismissal of the novelty. And I think there is something novel here. And I think to understand it, we have to situate not just the socio-technical possibility of transactional data, but the transformation of the social sciences in which this emergence is bound up. And at the most extreme form, um, this has taken the claim of an end to the scientific method. The screenshot is from a famous article or infamous article by the editor of Wired magazine, Chris Anderson, talking about how the incoming reality of big data makes science obsolete. Now all we need is data. This is something which uh, I think many people rejected at the time. It's been walked back from. And although I've not done a systematic analysis of it, when you look at the citations, it's hard not to suspect that actually this is most often cited 
in the way I'm doing now as an example of the extremes to which the advocacy of big data has gone. And I think we need to recognize that and recognize that most practitioners and advocates are making much more nuanced claims than this. But nonetheless, the dichotomies we can find in the end of theory article are ones which we still find in contemporary debates surrounding big data. The distinction between unobtrusive and obtrusive measurement, correlational versus causal, data mining or data dredging versus starting with research questions, and working with what are deemed to be whole populations versus samples. And I don't want to argue necessarily against these dichotomies. I think they have a conceptual force. Uh, and I think they do track something real uh, that is changing in the method of the social sciences. But what I'm interested in is how this conceptual force is leveraged alongside the metaphorical force of big data, this deluge, this flood, this avalanche overcoming us and the necessity that we find new methods to deal with it. And how conjointly this creates a sense of a brave new world which undermines the continuities, um, which I think are key to understanding if we want to look at how the social sciences are being changed by big data. To cite two obvious examples, uh, the census as a long established exercise in population level science. Also how secondary analysis could be considered an unobtrusive measurement. There are continuities and discontinuities rather than a sudden cut where emerging technologies intervene, disrupt existing reality and constitute a brave new world we must adapt to or be left behind. And this epo epochal cut obscures questions of ontology and epistemology. What is big data, again, as a singular concept? And what can we do with it? It obscures political economy, the heterogeneous array of actors who have vested interests in data analytics, the platform firms, the data analytics industry, data brokers, software developers, analytics platforms and consultants. And it obscures discipline, the new forms of expertise that are consolidating in the ideational morass produced. And I think we can see computational turns of some sort across a range of disciplines. But the one I'm going to talk about today because of its relationship to social sciences is the emergence of data science and data-driven computational social science. And the second image on the slide is a common representation of this, which shows data science as emerging at the intersection of a number of different kinds of expertise. And this is something I became interested in uh, soon after my PhD, when largely for matters of mundane expediency, I found myself working at a data science lab, despite having had no connection with the field previously. And I co-organized Europe's first computational social science conference. Uh, intellectually, I found this a wonderfully challenging experience and ethnographically, I found it fascinating because this was a world of social science um, quite unlike any I had encountered previously. And as someone who'd spent six years working on a PhD where N equals 18, it was a jarring, at times very unsettling experience to suddenly be working with people for whom N is a matter of millions or more. And data science of this sort <clears throat> is something which has emerged at the intersection of applied statistics, behavioral science, computer science, and social science. There's a huge commercial growth reflecting the expansion of a platform economy. So it's important to recognize the extent to which innovations in data science have been driven by commercial developments. There's an interesting genealogy here in terms of how relatively low status operations, such as data mining uh, in business, have become the high status pursuit of data science as the nature of the data collected has changed. And to the best of my knowledge, we still lack an adequate sociology of the commercial emergence of data science, the emergence of data science as an academic discipline and the relationship between the two. And you know, I have quite a lot of thoughts of this as someone who's sought to observe and read and find out more about this. But I think we need systematic knowledge because there's a lot of prima facie evidence that we're seeing a extremely consequential transformation in the organization of knowledge production. And it's happening at such a pace and beyond established disciplinary structures that I think it's often not entirely clear to most people that this is happening. Again, there's rhetoric surrounding the data scientists, which is akin to that which we find surrounding big data. Infamously, Harvard Business Review talked about it being the sexiest job of the 21st century. But I think we can also see evidence of a possible data science skills bubble because there's so much hope and aspiration, both in terms of individual career 
career prospects in a turbulent and unsettling labor market, but also in terms of the challenge of raising up human capital for a digital age. Data science, I think, can become a kind of cipher for digital development, digital innovation as a whole. And we see huge direct state investment in data science, but also indirectly through funding for machine learning and artificial intelligence. And these in particular are something I've become very interested in in recent weeks, because we can see the emerging sense of the geopolitical ramifications of these investments. I think we can see the early stages of a artificial intelligence arms race, where investment in these spheres of digital innovation are seen to have geopolitical ramifications in terms of the intellectual future intellectual struggle between competing poles in China, America, and the United States. And so the question that in a whole host of different uh, arenas, I found myself fascinated by in the last few years. And one of the reasons why I've now moved into an education department, because I want to study the change in the social sciences, is what does this mean for the organization of knowledge production? We see a huge influx of funding, <clears throat> a changing order of epistemic prestige, crucially a pluralization of claims to knowing the social world, including very tenable and practical claims outside of academia. And I think this challenges the propensity of academic social scientists to see themselves as at the center of knowledge production, whereas they think they, we are peripheral and being further peripheralized. And there are also radical new methodological opportunities, which a repudiation of the hype should not lead us to overlook. And I keep coming back to this hype because it's something that partly is an intellectual exercise and partly because I think it's crucial to understanding this stuff. I came to be fascinated by, um, because we have a tendency to see hype as a kind of epiphenomenal cultural froth that we should see through to see the underlying reality. But it's increasingly clear to me that hype surrounding technology, um, particularly as it's mobilized through powerful tropes like big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, hype in this sense can be a material force which can still benefit those who intellectually repudiate it. They may see it as crass, they may see it as unsophisticated, as lacking nuance. But the fact this hype exists structures the field within which they're working. And in this sense, I think we can see big data as a kind of discursive shield advancing a particular view of the social world and our knowledge of it. And addressing this entails working across disciplinary boundaries, because I think at least in these matters, and I'm increasingly open to the idea that the claim can be made more forcefully than this, we can't have an adequate account of the social, which isn't also an account of the technical. And at risk of stating the obvious, this disrupts the traditional organization of discipline-bound inquiry. And we see this in terms of the challenge we face when using categories like big data, algorithm, and machine learning, as if they refer to singular entities. It's very hard not to do that. I'm critiquing this and have critiqued it, and yet I've done it in this talk because it's very hard to talk in this register and not refer to these technological trends, these technological tendencies, as if they were singular things. But when we do this, we hypostasize a technical ontology, and this makes our social analysis difficult. It obscures the variability within each of these categories and the variability in their implementation. And it's precisely at that junction of the social and the technical that sociology and other social scientists have a lot to contribute to understanding the, the social, social playing out of these technical developments. And this also involves overcoming <clears throat> a schism between social theory and media theory. Uh, in a recent account by the media sociologists Andreas Hepp and Nick Coldry, they offered what I thought was a really powerful account of how social theory has tended to either ignore media systems entirely, um, and by media systems they mean what I'm referring to here as digital infrastructures, that media has tended to be seen as a specific domain, a specialization um, for right for specialized analysis as opposed to something woven into the fabric of the social or if social theory doesn't ignore media media systems it tends to build an antiquated account of media systems into the background assumptions it makes about how the social world operates and at a time when these media systems or as i'm referring to the digital infrastructures 
are both undergoing continuous change and are themselves driving social change, we need to overcome this chasm between social theory and media theory. And in doing so, it becomes easier to argue for a more expansive social science. Because in essence, and this is something I'll develop later on in the talk, my fear is that data science tends, if not necessarily, to constrain the real to what registers empirically within the horizons of digital infrastructures. And this contraction of horizons <clears throat> is often not obvious because of the sophistication with which it operates within this constrained and limited register. And so tentatively, I have thought of framing this in terms of contrasting questions of the philosophy of big data and the sociology of big data, which is a way of formalizing this underlying issue that I've been trying to explore of how we distinguish transactional data from the hype surrounding it. It's obviously only an analytical distinction because the implementation of transactional data is directed and legitimated by the hype. And in parallel, transactional data will tend to be inherently productive of asymmetries because the method through which data is generated and the characteristics of the data once generated are something which are more or less transparent to the engineers and the analysts working within the firms that are operating these platform infrastructures. But they are also opaque to those who are engineers. The character of the data that is gathered, the inferences that could be made from it, are at best unclear and often entirely unknown to those people who are registering within them. And these are not discrete groups because what I'm crudely referring to as the engineering, the engineers and the engineers can obviously swap roles. So an engineer from one firm may be, in the manner of speaking, engineered within another. What I want to get at is the underlying asymmetry, how ontologically what trans transactional data is and how it's generated creates this tendency towards social asymmetry. Because the dependence on digital infrastructure empowers those who operate it and intervene through it, but it disempowers those who are revealed through it and are susceptible to behavioral modification as a consequence of it. And this modification, or I think it would be better to say intervention, is something that's becoming a ubiquitous feature of the social world. And this is breaking into public consciousness now following the Brexit vote, following the election of Donald Trump, often with a slightly paranoid tinge attached to it and or a tendency towards technological determinism to see everything as fine before this devious new technology came along. And you know this obscures the complexity of the underlying sociology, because I think we have reason to think that any one of these interventions will have little to no effect. But what's crucial is the accumulation of intervention, where we increasingly live within intervention saturated environments, which I would argue are qualitatively distinct from interventions through mass media of a sort that are very familiar, simply because they can happen in real time there's little to no cost attached to them, and they can modulate in real time as well. So the intervener is able to learn from the intervention in order to increase its efficacy in future. And this is a radical change in the social environment, and it's one which I think allows us to trace characteristics of this change from the ontology of big data through to its epistemology, through to the sociology of how these technologies are taken up by organizations and corporate actors and put to work in the world. And this is why I'm so interested in the question of human agency here. Also, I guess, because it's what I spent six years doing a PhD on, so it's the natural frame through which I approach this. But it seems to me that human agency sit, sits at the intersection between the philosophy of big data and the sociology of big data. And in my work for the CSO project, <clears throat> I explored this in terms of how people are represented and what are the consequences of those representations? Uh, this is an account from a very thoughtful paper um, by David Lazare and his colleagues talking uh, about the kind of digital breadcrumbs. It's a, it's a thoughtful piece arguing for the potential of this kind of analytics. And he describes you know, a typical scene in a, in a digitally saturated environment. We wake up, we check our email, we make a phone call, we get on the bus, we arrive at the airport, we purchase a sandwich with a card. <clears throat> we visit the car mechanic. We generate records of these problems. All the while, we might be writing blog posts or maintaining social networks, revealing what we've been doing during the day. 
And I think this is interesting because it's a, it's a descriptively rich <clears throat> account of the opportunities apparently afforded by these digital breadcrumbs, by the, the generation of transactional data as a byproduct of everyday mundane activities. But within these mundane, amongst these mundane activities that they describe, we can see a great degree, degree of variability in terms of how agency operates from the maximally reflective, reflexive, expressing our thoughts and feelings through social media, for instance. And I should add that I think people can obviously use social media in relatively habitual ways. Um, but for sake of argument, consider you know very purposive uses of these communications technologies through to the minimally reflexive. So if we choose a particular sandwich shop because that shop allows us to accumulate reward points, which we would not be able to accumulate at another sandwich shop. This is a very fleeting, bound, mundane piece of internal conversation. But I think it's something that is quite typical in terms of how we are orientated towards digital infrastructures and how we act purposively in relation to them. And the problem I want to get across with this focus on behavioral traces is how it reduces action to behavior it reduces human being to behavioral traces. People act purposively in relation to the infrastructures that produce transactional data, but that purposiveness is systematically stripped out of the representations of their action. And this ontological reduction is often framed as an epistemic game. Uh, there's a book by a very prominent, behavior, a very prominent data scientist uh, with a subtitle, Who We Are When We Think No One Is Looking. And I love this title because I think it gets to the ethos underlying this stuff. The idea that we can cut through the messy thickets of interpretation and reveal the truth of human being beyond the dissimulation and disingenuity seen to characterize interpretation and speech. And furthermore, data science allows us to do this at scale. It allows us to do this in terms of what are taken to be whole populations without the mess or cost of designed intervention. Uh, Daniel Little uh, once used a phrase about this, describing a utopia of social legibility. And I think this is a really nice way of describing what the belief is that motivates this attitude, this ethos, this project even, to, as I've termed it, eviscerate the human, reduce the human to behavioral traces of human action. And it's a belief in a world where it's possible to read the book of society as if it were the book of nature. And I'd like to try and recover these commitments, recover what motivates data scientists, what motivates engineers, because in doing so, it helps make the reduction that's taken place of agency more clear. But it also foregrounds the people who are doing the reducing, the people behind the platforms and the material and ideational interests that also motivate their action. This is a particularly extreme example of the politics surrounding this. The revelations that Uber had what they called a God view, where a surprisingly large number of staff in Uber offices were able to spy on people, survey everyday activity through tracking their movements around cities in Ubers. Obviously, this is partial. And I think the fact this partiality may slip away from the people concerned is an important part of what Little is getting at with this terminology of the utopia of social legibility. But I want to stress how this kind of God view, these ways of knowing that big data facilitates, they, they are an institutional reality. This isn't just an epistemic conjecture. And yet, while increasing numbers of platforms have this God view or something akin to it, for all its partiality, these are extreme examples which are nonetheless the tip of the iceberg. The media theorist Mark Andreevich talks about this as a big data divide, a fundamental divide opening up between the data rich and the data poor. The data poor is susceptible to constant intervention by the data rich in pursuit of opaque private interests. Uh, and you know this is a very large topic that I'm just skimming over really and if anyone's interested I can talk more about this. And in different projects, I have written about the different aspects of this and I'm writing about it. Because what I want to get across is the way in which visions of the human are being promulgated, which deny agency 
and systematically erase the purposive relation people have to digital infrastructures. While nonetheless, those infrastructures are contributing to a profound root modification and transformation of human agency. To use uh, Archer's terminology, I think we're seeing a change in terms of primary agency, involuntary social placement, and the life chances that flow from this, as the digital economy is no longer a fringe concern. But actually, uh, what began around the edges is starting to become much more commonplace. In terms of practices like crowd working, the gig economy, um, compulsory freelancing, but we're also seeing a change in collective agency, the way in which these platforms facilitate the coordination and collaboration with others. Uh, I've written about this in terms of the notion of fragile movements, the idea that digital media makes it easier to choreograph the coming together of collectives, but makes it harder for those collectives to hold themselves together and exercise collective reflexivity. And while these sorts of nascent collectivities are becoming uh, ever more fleeting and fragile, the capacity for social action and social intervention facilitated by these systems for those who are data rich is quite profound and i think we're only now beginning to come to terms with what this means and the questions that flow from it <clears throat> and this is why i thought it a good place to finish would be to address this in terms of critical realism what does critical realism have to do with this and it's a question that was poignant for me simply because uh, I think in the course of pursuing these ideas, I've drifted away from critical realism, um, partly though not entirely because simply the people who were talking about the things I was interested in were elsewhere. But now that I'm at a stage four years on where I'm trying to more systematically weave these different threads together and get to this underlying issue that concerns me about digital capitalism and digital social science. If we accept that capitalism has always produced different kinds of ways of knowing itself, ways of producing social knowledge, if capitalism is entering a new phase, are we now seeing a new form of social science? And these questions are still very provisional in my mind, but I'm realizing quite how rich, I'm again realizing how rich the intellectual resources CR are for thinking through these kinds of issues. Firstly, uh, CR has an extremely sophisticated account of human agency, and I think this is necessary to unpick the multifaceted transformation of agency that's underway as a consequence of digitalization. There's also an extremely sophisticated account of the social production of facts about a real world. And I found myself thinking again and again <clears throat> in the last few years, what would the Roy Bascar of Reclaiming Reality say about data science? Uh, I can imagine the contours of an analysis that would flow from that mode. And I think it's a really interesting question to think through. There's also an extremely sophisticated meta theory, um, which at least my experience of roaming around in disciplinary terms in the last few years has been that this has become a relatively easy process because of these meta theoretical resources to make sense of what people are doing who frame their activity and understand their pursuits in a very different way to me. And I think this meta theory makes it easy to combine ontology, epistemology, methodology, and political economy in an, an agile way that is useful for drawing others into conversation across these boundaries. Because what motivates me here is this sense of underlying relationship between the emergence of the digital social sciences. And this is a heterogeneous, trying to think about how to phrase this the digital social sciences have many parts to them i'm talking about as well as data science and computational social science we see digital sociology digital anthropology digital geography uh field specific studies platform studies algorithm studies digital infrastructure studies there are many different parts to this but we have lots of new elements emerging and existing elements changing in how the social sciences orientate themselves towards these changing conditions while the conditions themselves are also changing. And my concern is that data science represents a form of social science which will struggle to turn its gaze upon the conditions which produced it. And because of this tendency to restrict the real to that which registers empirically within the confines of a platform, it stands to reason data science will not be able to take platform capitalism, digital capitalism as an object of analysis. 
And I think if we see the institutionalization of this as the primary or dominant form of social science, the emerging political economy of the capitalism that I think as of as recently as the last year or two is inarguably dominated by tech firms is going to become opaque. And a lot of questions flow from this about the capacity to hold capitalism to account, to critique contemporary states of affairs, even to track how those states of affairs are changing and who benefits from them. And critical realism, I think, offers us a way to think through how to overcome this narrowing of horizons, but also how to account for why this matters as a project. And so I hope this has been uh, useful, or at least coherent, because I'm aware of having covered a lot of ground. But I think all these pieces fit together in an interesting way. And I guess in my work as a whole, I've been struggling to try and make sense of these connections because I remain convinced something quite profound is underway in terms of both the transformation of capitalism, but also the transformation of social science. And I look forward to hearing your views and thoughts about this. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, I don't know about everybody else, but I found that really uh, just, just fascinating in terms of all the different dimensions. So thank you so much for that. Um, it was a shame that you weren't at the that our, our conference last year because you missed the presentation where John Moore uh, stood up to talk about the implications of big data and said effectively that big data creates a big data creates a crisis for quantitative sociologists because the traditional models of regression analysis simply don't work when it comes to big data and that there is a need for a more theoretical orientation simply because um, just the nature and the heterogeneity of, of big data is liable to yield you know, some results in terms of whatever you throw to it. Uh, I was wondering if you'd put any thought into some of the, the sort of methodological issues um, uh, uh, that, that sort of using um, big data uh, creates for um, social scientists or whatever your thoughts might be on, on that issue, if that makes uh, yeah, any sense. I'm, I'm particularly interested in the kinds of pragmatic adaptations. So how we recover the context in which people are working and, you know, the questions of what data there are actually what they are actually working with to begin with. Yeah. And, you know, how new forms of inference, new forms of analysis emerge as a consequence of working under slightly constrained circumstances. Because my sense is that the people who are driving things forward in terms of digital methods are operating with a much clearer view of the constraints on this than the people who are talking abstractly about it. And you know, I think these kinds of methodological trade-offs um, that people make quite pragmatically aren't always filtering upwards into you know the kind of formalization of social science methods. Right. So in other words, there's a, a disconnect emerging between those who are more attuned to um, the sort of methodological limits of big data and the general promises of big data? Yeah, exactly. And I think uh, my impression is that there's a, a lack of places to have discussions that bridge these different levels. So people who are encountering these practical challenges in their applied work find that, you know, this is too methodological for mainstream journals. Um, but too messy for methodology journals. Right. Um, I'm curious in terms of your research, have you, in terms of, and again, this is probably a question for me, uh, in, have you, is there been much discussion in, in sort of on the more philosophical register as to the implications of big data, particularly thinking in terms of, you know, some of the classic critical realist um, sort of uh, conversations about causation, for example? Uh, yes, but my impression is that it's quite partial. Um, so I don't think there is anything akin to a unified field of philosophy of data science. I right. think there are people, all sorts of people doing very interesting work in different ways in relation to the philosophical challenge here. But they're not speaking to each other. And this is why I'm interested in how this is bound up in the transformation of the academy. The tendency in an accelerating academic context for people who are working um, on the front lines of new developments to not be in a position to pass this backwards into mainstream disciplinary awareness. 
And I think this is why we see the emergence of discrete fields outside of disciplinary structures. And I'm interested in the kind of knowledge transmission that perhaps isn't happening, where the work being done in areas like digital methods, critical algorithm studies, critical data studies, how do we ensure this is passed back? So social science disciplines are able to better equip themselves to upskill and reorientate. Uh, you know, I, I think the, the contemporary structures of the academy, particularly in the UK, um, but I say that simply because I, I see them much more closely, are ill-equipped to facilitate this kind of distributed innovation. Yeah, I think that's a fair thing to say about the US as well. Um, I'm, I'm curious, in, in that sort of context, in terms of the, um, the sort of analysis of big um, data, in addition to, to some of the issues you've raised, I mean, uh, what advantages do you see in a, sort of a general critical realist analysis in terms of um, uh, or just in terms of unpacking some of the advantages that you see of critical realism uh, in providing the analysis of of big data sorry could you repeat the first bit of the question um just in terms of sorry that was that was a, a rambling sort of question um, whether you could unpack uh, in more details what advantages you see critical realism providing in the, the analysis of big data, say, over other approaches? Uh, yeah, I mean, the one that I'm most familiar with is the advantage in terms of human agency. Uh, so, obviously, given my PhD and subsequent work, uh, Archer and Donati, um, you know, I've worked very closely with their account of agency. but. In trying to make sense in the most recent contribution I made to the CSO project, the distinction between uh, primary and collective agency there, um, and also between the strata, the different levels of the the person, the actor, and the agent, proved very useful um, to try and make sense of how agency can be changing in multiple registers at the same time. Because I think one of the most interesting aspects of this is how collectivity is becoming more efficacious for some while becoming less effective for others while everyone's primary agency is changing uh, and i think that's a very complex thing to unpack and i think if you don't have an ontological distinction between these different levels to agency it's, it's very hard to make sense of that process no, that's really helpful. Yeah, that sort of, that stratification really opens up uh, a, a sort of different way of um, well, a, more a complexity to the analysis of something like agency. I really like that. To give an example, I mean, uh, since finishing my PhD, I've been slowly working on a book about digital distraction, which unfortunately I keep getting distracted from. <laughs> um, but I, I will hopefully finish that by the end of this year. And so uh, I think CR has powerful resources to make sense of, you know, the, the everyday experience of the individual subject, which is my focus in the distraction book. And, you know, I'd want to combine those different levels of analysis. So distracted people um, struggling to join fragile movements. Meanwhile, other actors are becoming much more effective and much more opaque. Um, and to be able to work with those different levels not as different moments but as different aspects of the same moment i think is a very powerful thing to be able to do right no that sounds really interesting um, um just um working through some other questions um um i'm i suppose I, i'm interested in in terms of um this, this question of, I suppose, disciplinary splits or um, division of labor regarding approaches uh, to big data. Um, and I'm just curious in terms of uh, any reflections you might have on how um, big data potentially opens up um, uh, questions about interdisciplinary uh, research or um, these sort of questions about uh, academic division of labour, or if it if it reinforces more traditional hierarchies for that matter. 
uh, I think we're seeing <clears throat> I think we're seeing a growth of cross-disciplinary teams in response to these challenges but it's become very clear to me that there's a difference between a team being multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary uh, I organized a workshop at a social media conference a few years ago looking at the the everyday lived challenges of working in interdisciplinary teams and uh, the challenge of epistemic prioritization came up really strongly then um, the extent to which social scientists working in teams of computer scientists often felt secondary or peripheralized and I have anecdotally seen evidence of the same relationship the other way around where a computer scientist or a computational scientist is brought into a more traditional social science setup as a technician as someone who performs a certain job and I think when we have that kind of division of labor where we have command and control relationships within multidisciplinary teams we don't really have an answer to the challenge of the socio-technical um, and so I think any investigation that bridges these gaps runs up against this historical legacy and you know the difficulty we have working around it. So I've become very interested in strategies that can ameliorate this. Uh, I spent a year working with the game designer to design an ontology card game that was intended to address the issue. Uh, it was a really interesting process. Uh, the project stalled because we finished the game, but the game wasn't fun. And you know the fact the game was boring to play slightly defeated the point. Um, there's an American project called the Toolbox Project, uh, funded by the National Science Foundation, who you know have a very different approach, but are similarly similarly concerned with a kind of philosophical harmonization or philosophical dialogical precondition within cross disciplinary teams. Uh, and you know I think CR has a lot of value for making sense of the problems that emerge in these contexts, the problems that can be simultaneously organizational, epistemic, uh, ontological, ethical, interpersonal. You know, it's a very complex terrain about why working between disciplines sometimes doesn't work or how it could work better. Right. I'm curious, has anybody in terms of the, the big data field made uh, any any case or claims to unifying um, the field in any in any respects? Uh, yeah, arguably. I mean, so for instance, the you know the, the discipline of social physics can be seen as an attempt at this unification. Um, so I mean, in in one sense, I use the term data science relatively loosely, just because it's the most common self designation, and it's also you know, a hyped term that performs this role as a trope of organizing new developments. Um, but as well as this, I mean, we see um, computational social science, which in many ways is part of and overlaps with established quantitative social science, and particularly in the US context, computational sociology. Um, we can see econophysics emerging at the intersection between, as you might guess, economics and physics. Uh, and, you know, there, there are many developments like this. Um, you know, I think the the, the, the the intellectual developments happen at a pace that far exceeds reflection upon them, or at least reflection through the medium of peer-reviewed journals. And this is why I'm so interested in the the pace of change in academic life and the sterile time horizons of traditional means of academic communication. I think a lot is changing a lot more quickly than we realize and one of the reasons why we tend not to realize it is because um, the time lag for the formalization of practice is untenable given the speed at which these developments are occurring. Interesting. I, I mean I'm curious you mentioned um, uh, the oh, the like the social physics movement. I'm curious about um, your take on the digital humanities movement and its relationship to, to big data. I think this is a very complex and potentially controversial question that I'm <laughs> reticent about blundering into. Um, and you know, That's right, someone... blunder away. We won't help you through it. 
uh, as someone who identifies as a digital sociologist, the relationship between digital sociology, which I think has natural affinities with digital anthropology and digital geography, um, the relationship between digital sociology and the digital humanities is very ambiguous and very unclear. Um, and I think the digital humanities as well are a multifaceted entity. Um, and it's one of those topics where my thoughts are sufficiently unclear that I'm reluctant <laughs> to offer them, you know, apart from in writing, just because, you know, I want to try and cite examples of people's own words to make these claims. Sure. No, completely understandable. I just thought I'd ask and somebody else asked as well. Um, uh, so, um, I'm curious in terms of the, um, just some of the dynamics that, that you mentioned uh, in terms of some of the changes with, uh, uh, with um, sort of big data in terms of, well, knowledge production claims and how do you see them differing from uh, traditional accounts in particular? Um, do you see a distinction uh, with the, the sort of changing nature of, um, well, let's just throw the word out there in terms of positivism and the relationship between uh, sort of earlier forms of positivism and um, current forms. Do you, I mean, how, how would you situate big data in relation to positivism and in relation to the, the sort of history of social science, if that's not too um, broad and vague a question? No, it's, it's one I'm fascinated by. It's one that uh, if I'd been able to attend your conference last year, this is what I'd intend to Yeah, you to would talk. have had the answer to it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, for the, on one level, I think it's quite a straightforward question. Um, I think we are seeing a resurgent positivism. Um, you know, digital positivism in response to digital capitalism um, or a digitalized capitalism. Uh, I think on another level, it's actually a much more complex question, just because the the very the programmatic accounts of big data and data science are relatively rare in terms of what is written and what is published and what is done. These attempts to programmatically set out what is happening are the exception rather than the rule. And interpretively, that opens up the question of should we take these as a formalization of something that is implicit elsewhere? Or are these perhaps usually academics with their own academic concerns who are putting a particular theoretical and meta theoretical spin on something that others might not wish others might not share? And I'm unclear what the answer to that question is. Insofar as the people working in th this mode do offer formally worked out philosophical, philosophically orientated accounts of what they're doing, this is straightforwardly positivism of a new sort. Um, but I'm not sure that necessarily represents the trend as a whole. Right, interesting. Um, and just the, to go to the inverse of that, I mean, you and I are both sort of, well, let's call it sympathetic critics of, of critical realism. Um, do you think uh, that uh, the, the question of big data raises um, particular uh, challenges or problems for uh, sort of critical realism or you know, broadly critical realist approach? Uh, I think with some very honourable exceptions, um, like Dave Aldevas, Alistair Much, John Mingus, um, critical realism has been weak on the technical. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think this is a, a real issue, but I mean, it's one that's actually very easy to rectify because I think these are distinctions which we've always drawn, but haven't really elaborated a lot of the time. And I think that lack of elaboration reflects a broader tendency in social theorizing um, that I suggested about ossifying or ignoring digital systems. Uh, and I think we have to have a more nuanced appreciation of the way in which artifacts and infrastructure are embedded in social processes. Um, there was a very interesting JCR article a few years ago by Oliver Bonington, who suggested updating uh, Maggie Archer's idea of the SAC. So explanations have a structural element, an agential element, and a cultural element. And he suggested that we should instead think of a cast 
So there's always a technical part to an explanation, even if it might contingently be a peripheral part of what we're explaining. And, you know, I quite like that idea. Um, and that's often how I've approached this. Mm. Oh, very good. I'm just, I'm just curious, just a, um, just a smaller question. Are there any articles um, in terms of big data, critical realism or otherwise that you would suggest? Or recommend? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, could I pull some things together and email you? Sounds good. That's probably a better way of doing it. Um, um, otherwise, I think. Um, oh, here's here's a question I'll throw. Do you think um, that the issues raised by by big data as well as um, by various social media platforms and um, various social data. Do you think this is this requires, um, or how do you um, see this in terms of uh, our thinking through issues of social ontology? Um, do you think either big data or the, the social realities behind big data or the influence of big data, uh, or social media platforms on society, um, in some way warrant like a rethinking of sort of critical um, or traditional notions of social ontology? Do you think there's a, a sort of fundamental change at that level? Uh, I, I don't ultimately. Um, you know, I think the challenge is more to do with how we deploy ontological reasoning to analyze concrete processes. Um, you know, and so I'm very open to assemblage thinking, for instance, because I think when we're looking at, say, how platformization, to use a horrible neologism, operates, this is it's a very hard process to unpick, simply because there's an awful lot going on at the same time. And so I, I don't think we necessarily need to fundamentally shift how we think about ontology, but we do need to become more agile in how we think about ontology in relation to these changes. No, that, that, that's good. I like that answer. Um, uh, well, with that, we might actually leave it there. Um, I think that's a, a good place to, to, to leave it as any other. So thank you, Mark, for um, spending time and sharing your thoughts on, on big data. I found this very, very interesting. I look forward to um, the articles that you recommend, which I'll circulate to everybody who registered. Um, but thank you, Mark, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, we are planning on having later uh, webinars later in this year, um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, but uh, for the time being, uh, thank you for coming. The recording will be available online, and we'll see you all next time. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.